Safety is the most important thing. And this mining method, right, underground mining like this has been around for a century. It's not new, it's definitely tried, tested, and uh, it's been part of the fabric of the, you know, of the mining industry for a very long time. The Adrenaline Zone has explored risks and opportunities with plenty of people who spend a lot of time underwater. But today we talk to someone who spends a lot of time underground. Vicky PC is the general manager for the Rio Tinto's Resolution Copper Mine in Arizona, which is one of the largest copper resources in North America. The heart of the mine is 7,000 feet underground. That's 1.3 miles. And we were curious about how mines work the risks involved, and what it's actually like to be that far underground. Many thanks to our sponsor for this episode, Culligan Water. With Culligan's drinking water systems, you can get the ultra-filtered water you need to fuel your high-performance lifestyle right on tap. Learn more at Culligan.com. And Vicki was kind enough to speak to us from her office in Arizona. So, Vicki, welcome to the Adrenaline Zone. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. Thanks, Sandra. Really uh, happy to be here today. Yeah. So uh, again, it's great to have you. Uh, we always like to hear about, you know, what our guests, you know, where they came from. So what drew you to the mining industry? Is it because it runs in your family or, you know, and, and what kind of education uh, does one get when they want to go into that industry? Uh, I would imagine it's not a huge community if, at the executive level. Yeah, I, I actually come from a mining family. My uh, my dad is a miner, my sister, uh, brother-in-law, my husband. Uh, but really, I'd say it was my dad that really encouraged me to take a degree in, in engineering. And uh, he helped me get summer jobs. And it's the wide breadth of of interesting issues. Everything, it's very science-based, it's technology, but a lot of environmental stewardship, innovation, and community partners. And the kind of education it's, you know, I've got a master's of uh, master's of science degree in civil engineering, but it's really all sorts, uh, technical college degrees like electricians, mechanics, instrument technicians, to biologists, um, archaeologists, financial professionals. You know, it doesn't always come down to education, although it's definitely vital to many fields. It's really more about training and experience working, uh, especially underground, is the experience that you gain on the job. You know, you're in a management role now. We were just talking uh, before we started recording that you started in pit mining. You did some environmental remediation. You spent some time uh, a little bit underground, but you're at Rio Tinto now. That's a wide variety of experiences. So what are the big lessons you've learned across all of that experience? The big lesson is there's just such a diversity of interesting um, issues and and you know, things to tackle inside of a, of a mine, there's, I think what really, you know, the thing if I had to really boil it down to anything is that it's probably much easier to engineer, um, right? It's when you and the rock, but when it comes to maybe areas outside of the mine, like communities, social performance, having people understand our business, it's very, very technical. It's very, very high tech. And um, I think that we have a long way to go to help sort of change the face of mining, the perspectives that people have um, to try and, you know, stand in our shoes and, and understand, you know, what mining really is and isn't. So, Vicki, there are a lot of different types of, of minerals that come out of the ground, and they're so important in manufacturing and a whole host of other things that are done around the planet. And in keeping with those, those different types of minerals, there's different types of mines, right? Uh, can you give our listeners kind of an overview of the industry and what kind of stuff are you pulling out of the ground and what kind of mine does it have to be? Yeah, well, so Rio, Rio Tinto is a really the second biggest diversified mining company globally. Um, you know, I'll zoom it down into, so here in the U.S., uh, you know, in Canada, North America, I guess we're really the second largest producer of final refined metals and critical minerals. Majority is used for the U.S. domestic market. So everything from high purity aluminum, um, which is, you know, manufactured in um in our Canadian operations and is used in your iPhones to the body of the Ford F-150 to the Boeing airplanes. Um, green iron ore, which feeds U.S. steel mills to uh, borates, uh, which are used in just about everything from detergents to aircraft coatings uh, for, for entry into, you know, back into Earth so we don't burn, up, burn them up. Uh, we also are a very big copper producer 
We've got 100 years of copper operations um, at our Utah copper wow. mine, and we produce about 15% of the U.S. demand for copper, along with a whole host of other goodies like gold, silver, molybdenum that's used to harden steel, and critical minerals that have interesting names like tellurium, which are used in the coatings of solar panels or to night vision goggles. So lots of lots of different minerals. Wow. So you hear a lot about um, minerals that uh, are not mined in the U.S. that are in other countries, and and we're sort of hostage to them. Is that because the production costs are so low in those countries, uh, or is it because the stuff is just not in North America? There are some minerals that are really not present in large quantities in North America. One would be cobalt. So the Democratic Republic of Congo, really, you know, 70 percent of of cobalt comes comes out of that one single country. The U.S., though, has very wide array of, of minerals. I say the amount of copper deposits. There was a time actually when the U.S. was number one global producer of copper. Um, today, we still have lots of copper mines, uh, or dozens across the country. And the unique thing about copper is it tends to have a lot of, we used to call them impurities, today we call them critical minerals. So not all copper deposits are created equal, but about a dozen, half a dozen or a dozen uh, critical minerals can be made from copper as long as you have a smelter and a refinery uh, that you can pull them out of. So many of these minerals aren't actually mined in their own right like indium or tellurium, you won't have those types of mines, but you make them as a co-product of copper. Hmm. I'll be darned. Yeah, you know, okay. that's, I could talk to you for hours. <laughs> but, you know, mining, it's an endeavor that takes decades. So it requires a long-term approach. And I was reading about how you were working with the Resolution Mine Project and the work you had to go through to minimize risk to the environment, to plan, you know, to minimize the business risk, to you know, that just manage that risk through every stage. Can you just talk us through the thought process that a, a company has to go through? You know, really starts with a great amount of care and investment in really gathering baseline information. And that starts with the environment that you will potentially be operating in and potentially impacting to the communities that are on your doorstep and are your closest neighbors to maybe Native American tribes that are located further away, but that have ancestral ties or historic ties to the same areas. So it is years, decades, really for us, two decades of gathering that environmental baseline data, as well as the, the social data with the communities. And when we overlay our plans, then we can look at, you know, through that dialogue, multi-stakeholder dialogue with communities, tribes, regulators, we start avoiding and minimizing things that are important, like recreation, ancestral sites, seeps, springs, waterways. And it's this collaborative dialogue that takes a long time, years, to look at alternatives so that you can avoid the, the special places that people like and come out with something that is mutually acceptable. Well, it's got to be a capital intensive, you know, the money meter is running for 10 years. Uh, so that that's a huge part of the business, I'm sure, um, you know, before you even pull the first thing out of the ground. Yeah. So a deposit like Resolution Copper is it's very unique. It is, you know, one and a half billion tons at one and a half percent copper. These deposits are not a dime a dozen. They're really like looking for a needle in a haystack. Um, we happen to have you know, Resolution is located in the footprint of an old underground mine called Magma Copper. It's in a district called the Copper Triangle, where mining has really been part of the fabric of the community for 100 years. So there is infrastructure here, right? There is power. There is, um, so I think that makes that that much, much better. But these types of projects take a lot of upfront investment. We've spent $2.3 billion just collecting the data, right? Um, and gathering the information that you need to put together a plan and navigate um, the federal uh, and the stakeholder approval processes. This and this is pretty routine these days with these types of deposits. Wow. So how about the the actual, once you get all the approvals and everything's out of the way, there's a construction phase, right? You, you start basically digging. How do you do that? How do you do it safely? How do you stabilize the tunnels? What kind of equipment is involved? You know, what is this like when you're going you know, and everybody can visualize a pit mine, but how about going that deep underground? First of all, right, it's all about safety. 
and you risk assess and understand what are all of the issues that you could run into and you make sure that you have a management plan for everything. But we have to make sure that everybody goes home safely, whether we're working on surface or working underground. And then again, it's the data that you collect slowly and progressively as you're sinking a shaft down the 7,000 feet, tunneling underground out to the ore body. Every bit of geotechnical data, air quality data um, goes in and you constantly refine uh, and, and build your mine plan. So safety is really instrumental in every aspect of the design from ventilation to cooling to guarding of equipment. A lot of risk analysis. There's a lot of overlap, I think, between how you guys approach a problem and how we approach a problem in the space industry. We live and breathe control. risk assessments. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All the time. So so how do you actually get down to 7,000? You got elevators or how do you guys move people around in a mine like that? How do they know where they're going? Yeah. So there's uh, the way, well, there's a lot of different ways to to get to an underground deposit, but a deposit like resolution where the top of it is 5,000 feet below the ground and the bottom is down to about 6,900. You have wow. to, to sink something that's called a shaft or many shafts, which is really a very a long straight tube uh, that goes from surface all the way to the to the base of the deposit. And then after that, you do a tunnel, right? Or a series of tunnels underneath the deposit and then eventually drill and blast, and gravity brings the ore down slowly and progressively over time. And as you remove the ore, it continues to fall down. Um, so the specific type of underground mining that is suited to this type of deposit, right, very big, relatively low grade, very deep, is called caving. So how do you get the, the ore out of there? I mean, it's got to go back up 7,000 feet, right? Yes. So it would be, you know, I guess this is where the really the coolness and the, the cool factor and the high tech factor comes in because it's so deep. Um, we would have a network. So it's going to be like imagine an underground city and you have a network of hundreds of miles of underground tunnels. And within those tunnels, there is battery electric equipment or underground type of equipment that is low profile loaders, right, that are scooping or out. They're loading them into battery electric trucks. The trucks are driving them, you know, many, many miles back to where the shafts are located. And that's where you then are going to crush and grind larger rocks into something that's about a soccer ball size. And then you put them in buckets um, and you hoist them back up uh, to a location either to surface or to another tunnel that'll take it out to a processing facility. So all of this activity is happening underground and you really won't see much on the surface at all. So what's the role of the human being in that process? Well, a little bit different than an open pit mine where you typically have someone driving a truck or driving a loader. Uh, the human being is really more high tech. So rather than your truck driver sitting in the cab of the truck, that individual will be sitting on the surface in an air conditioned, you know, building using a joystick controlling the truck 7,000 feet below the ground. So, you know, somebody who's in seventh grade today, who's a really great gamer, could be our future, you know, hull truck operator I'll be darned. You know, when we're, when we're wow. up and running. So, so is there anybody down, down 7,000 feet at all? Yes. Or is it all um, remotely piloted? Yeah. So, of course, ventilation and cooling is very important, right? To constantly make sure there's fresh air and cooled air. There's, uh, you know, the temperature of our mine is about 165 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so we still have to send people down though to maintain equipment. Uh, and the network of infrastructure that sits in the hundreds of miles of tunnels in this underground city, right? Imagine the network of electrical lines, HVAC systems, pipelines, um, through all those hundreds of miles of tunnels, there is a lot. Uh, so we start to think about it, it's not, you know, the number of jobs or thousands, right? And they're not, it doesn't reduce the jobs, but the type of job is different. So two-year trade school, um, right? Electricians, mechanics, instrument technicians are the type of jobs. So if I got this right, you, you have, most of this is remotely piloted vehicles that are doing the grinding and the crushing and the movement of the ore. But every now and then you have to send a human down into 165 degrees. The host rock at the bottom, uncooled, is, is 165 degrees, but we have a massive um, air conditioning and ventilation that keeps it at about somewhere between 70 and 80 degrees. Wow. 
and and this is a this is sort of just for our listeners' sake. It's a three dimensional structure because you've got levels, right? Or are you just operating on one level? But you're operating on multiple levels at a time potentially. There would be multiple levels. There would be right laterally multiple levels. Um, and you were the footprint of this deposit is huge. I, it's really hard to put it into perspective, but you know, one point five to eight billion tons is it will take us uh, at years, decades, right, to, to mine through this. And it is uh, a, you know, slow and progressive uh, over time. So I have to ask, how do people not get lost? I mean, you have street signs or we have, we have so we have a location coding system on the space station so that we know, you know, one, you know, lab one, deck five. We know exactly where that is in the lab so we can go find our equipment. You probably have a similar system. Exactly. Right? Everything is totally engineered, right? Every level has a, as a right has level station name. And just like you would in your own town, you have signs, right? So the tunnels are roads. Everything is signed. Uh, and we'll have Wi-Fi, every, you know, radios will be, right? You'll have to communicate constantly. And we do have tracking devices. So we know where equipment is at any one time. So everybody can find their way in, find their way out. And we can find anybody if something's not, um, you know, equipment's down. Hmm. Yeah, you, we talk about you know, iron workers to go up and work on skyscrapers, you know, hundreds of feet above the, gr above the ground. I would imagine there's a little bit of a psychology associated with going that deep underground. Maybe like the same as a submarine. It's like, okay, this is what I do. I trust the equipment. But is there? Is it kind of weird being down that far underground? I would think. Do, do the people kind Can't of think about that? You have to come and yeah. visit, and and I think you need to come and. Yeah. I would love it to come it's, and it's, visit. It's yeah. um, the openings in the voids are very big, right? So the tunnels are, you know, the shafts are thirty meters in diameter. The tunnels are very, very large. So. You, you know, you're not in these tiny little openings. So it has that degree of that that brings a degree of of comfort. Um, and once you're down there, you really don't notice that you're that far underground. But yeah, no, I think it does get some, you, you know, gets, you know, have to get used to to doing that and, and working underground. And um, but it's very, very safe. Right. Again, we risk we live and breathe risk assessments. Safety is the most important thing. And this mining method, right, underground mining like this has been around for a century. It's not new. It's definitely tried, tested, and uh, it's been part of the fabric of the, you know, of the mining industry for a very long time. You're passionate about pushing yourself to always be better. Culligan's water experts feel the same. That's why their smart reverse osmosis filtration systems do more than deliver ultra-refreshing, pure-tasting water. Their app also lets you set drinking water goals, seek water quality information, and get filter change alerts. And with cleaner, safer, great-tasting water available right from the tap, you can also feel good about all those single-use plastic bottles you're saving from landfills. Get started with water you love today. Schedule your free water test at Culligan.com. So, you know, on, on Space Station and or Shuttle too, but we train for specific kinds of emergencies, you know, fire, in our case, a depressurization event and a toxic atmosphere. So what kind of emergencies and training do you guys, you know, talking about safety and trying to get people to react instinctively in case of an emergency, what kind of things do you guys train for and plan for? Very similar, right? We have an emergency response yeah. team and we're also mm -hmm. heavily regulated. The Mine Health and Safety Administration is a federal agency that oversees the mining industry. Ah, who knew? Um, yeah. And so there are rules and regulations on everything from operations to specifically emergency response. Uh, so fire is is one, right? Um, obviously, air and and oxygen particulate. So we have an emergency response team. We have um, constant drills that we're always testing to make sure that we can, you know, we have plans in place and safety procedures and emergency response, and we test it on a constant basis and we practice uh, to make sure the teams are right, fully equipped, have all the training and everything that they need to respond. Yeah, it sounds very, very, very similar to what we do. You know, as, as we were talking, Vicky, it got me wondering, um, what is the deepest mine that you're aware of that is 7,000 feet about as far as you can go? What do you guys, how far do you go? Yeah, well, so we're not the deepest mine. Uh, resolution is about 6,940 feet. Uh, but the deep, deepest mine- Give or take 
deepest mines are in, yeah, give or take, yeah, uh, deepest mines are in South Africa. Uh, third, Anglo Gold in, has a mine in Johannesburg, and it's 13,200 feet. Uh, so two and a half miles. Wow. It's, that's very, very deep. There are mines in Canada, one's called Kid Creek, and that's 9,800 feet. Uh, we just recently also, Rio Tinto brought on the first new uh, underground block cave mine to be very similar to Resolution, and that's about 4,500 feet deep. So do you guys have a, uh, an organization that where you swap safety stories and share learning points around safety? Because we kind of have something like that across the space agency. We do, yeah. So industry, so we do within our company, we have these centers of excellence. We have an underground center of excellence, which we have mining experts, underground mining experts from across the globe. So at all of our underground mining facilities across the world, we share expertise. And then we're also part of industry groups. So International Council on Mining and Metals is a forum where not just underground, but everything, right, is is shared and it's about best practice and it's about elevating the industry, right, that our peers, you know, we we share best practice and uh, and we do the right thing. Yeah. So I imagine one of the most dicey things that your team has to deal with is uh, explosives. Uh, you know, you're blasting this stuff out, you know, you're underground, you're blasting it out, uh, special training, special techniques. I mean... People have probably done this for decades that are in charge of it. Tell, tell us a little bit about handling uh, the explosives and how you handle that risk. Yeah, ju just like you said, right? In the mining industry, been around for over 100 years. Explosives are day to day, right? In the fabric of, of what we've done. And they have um, you know, very, very serious procedures uh, and practices. So I'll go back to strict, strict guidelines and regulations that are set forth by the Federal Mine Health and Safety Act, number one, as well as the Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms. So both of those federal agencies have extensive regulations on how to handle, manage, store um, explosives, right? They have to be stored in a specific, its own, own area. Um, you have to have special training in order to actually transport them and handle them. They're, you know, you take account of what's on site at any given time. So it's very, very uh, heavily regulated um, and we take it very seriously. You talked about the regulations. The U.S. has some, but all the regulations in the different countries are not necessarily the same. I, when I trained in Russia for a while and, you know, we we had this out on this creaky boat doing sea survival and our OSHA guys came over and they were making all these comments and I was just kind of laughing because that's not the, the culture over there in Russia. And I'm in different countries. So the different countries have different. How do you guys deal with that? Because you have standards you have to live up to here and you want to make sure your people are safe. But yet you interface with these other countries and it's a completely different concept. How do you guys? Deal well, with you that? have to follow the law in the jurisdiction that you're operating yeah. in. Right. That is when it did. Yeah. So, so I'll say Rio Tinto has corporate global standards for health, safety, environment, community, social performance, cultural heritage. So that there is a standard um, across the globe that, that is best practice. In the U.S., I would say, though, we are the gold standard of regulations. Uh, it's pr probably really tough to find another country that is as highly regulated, um, but that's a good thing. So obviously we have, we've talked about MSHA, right, Mine Safety and Health Administration. OSHA applies as well, you know, ATF. So health and safety is highly, highly regulated. Um, we also have you know, environmental regulations, everything from right the Federal Clean Water Act to the Federal Clean Air Act to the Safe Drinking Water Act, to the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, there's there's many, many, many hundreds and hundreds that is either at the federal level, the state level, the local level, and it's just part of doing business. We've been operating in the United States for whether it's our boron facility beside Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, to the you know copper facility in Utah, we've been operating for a hundred years. You know, with these regulations, it's it's just day to day. Well, and frankly, you know, you you uh, we used to hear decades and decades ago when I was a little kid, uh, when dinosaurs roamed the earth, that that you know mine accidents were not uncommon. But now, knock on wood, in the U.S., you just don't hear about them very much. While you still still hear about them overseas. So what you're saying makes sense. That you know, we do have the highest standards uh, around the world for safety. I think so, and environment, really both. Yeah. So, um, question for you on uh, the ore. It comes up. It's now on the surface. 
uh, it's, it's soccer ball size. It's got to get turned into something else. Do you do that on site or do you move it, you know, transport it to another facility to kind of take the next steps to turn it into something that's actually usable? Yep. So you want to have all of your facilities mining to processing as close as possible. That's what makes the most sense. Uh, so once the ore is crushed right to the soccer ball size, it will go on a series of conveyors, again, underground to a processing um, plant. So it takes soccer ball size ore, which might have one to 2% copper in it, somewhere in there, and you crush it through a series of, of crushing mills and then um, put it in a series of, we call them flotation, but they're like these cells that have water and reagents like alcohols that make bubbles. And funny enough, the copper materials uh, stick to the bubbles and they go to the surface and you skim off the surface and you make something that's called, we call it concentrate or copper concentrate, which is about maybe about 30% uh, percent copper. Um, so it goes from about 1% to 30% by crushing, grinding, concentrating uh, in a facility that is located adjacent to the mine. So what do you do with the waste products of like all the, all the stuff that's not the copper? You know, you've extracted the copper, but there's still a lot of leftover rock and things. What, what happens with all of that? Is it, is it okay? For, maybe I'll just finish off from 30% copper. I'll go really quickly. Um, and we'll, after that, it goes to a smelter and a refinery. So Rio Tinto has, there's, there was a time when there were two dozen smelters and refineries uh, in the United States that, that made copper because U.S. was number one uh, globally as far as copper production until about the late 1980s. Uh, there's two copper smelters left and two copper refineries left in the United States that operate today. So we do have one. Um, so after that, you take the concentrate, it goes to a, a smelter and it, um, right, you sort of cook the rock and melt it and it further separates to about a 99% copper and then after that, it goes to a refinery where you electro win. So you have an anode with copper that plates copper in a refinery, electro refinery over to a cathode. And you make 99.99% um, copper. And uh, we make about 15% of the U.S. demand uh, today for copper, as well as, you know, all the other goodies that come along with it. And those, those come out as ingots or? Um, they come out as, like a, as a cathode. So like a very big sheet that's about maybe three feet by four oh. feet. Yeah. Okay. And then goes to market. The uneconomic, so after you crush and grind, so we go back to the, to the concentrator, you know, where we're making 30% copper concentrate, the crushed ground up sand-like material that's left over is called tailings. And um, tailings are highly regulated. Well, they don't contain economic minerals in them anymore, but they contain very small quantities, maybe parts per million, parts per billion, parts per trillion of lead or cadmium, right? These sort of other metals. And so they must, they are highly regulated, federal, state regulations. They must be specifically cited, engineered, stored, and then monitored. Uh, very closely over the life of the mine to make sure that we don't have dust that can create air issues or seepage that can create groundwater issues. Are you putting them back in pockets of the mine you're not using anymore? Depends. That's a, I mean, it's a lot of stuff. Depends on the underground method. In some cases, you can put um, tailings underground. In, um, for a block cave mine, you can't because the voids end up being consumed by, by broken rock, so they would be stored on the surface. Interesting. We talked a little earlier about the huge upfront investment, uh, you know, $2 billion already put in into this project. And how, how soon do you expect, uh, assuming all regulatory approvals and that sort of thing, to actually start bringing material out of the mine? Or are you already? Uh, maybe about sort of six to 10 years before we can, what we'd have to do is um, develop out the tunnels out to the ore body. And that will take take time. Um, it just, we, you know, the, where the shafts are located compared to where the ore body is located is quite a distance away. Um, but in that time, right, we would be, so there'd be an years and years of underground development work, many billions more, uh, that you wouldn't see anything on the surface. You know, I'm going to take us on a tangent for a minute because listening to this, I knew this was going to be a great conversation because there's so many parallels with space. So there's a lot of parallels between how you guys are have outfitted and are managing your minds with the automated the mix of people and automation that I think have lessons for how we eventually go back to the moon and and set up our infrastructure there. 
It would be interesting to have some of the uh, NASA architects come and chat with how you guys operate to draw some of those well, lessons. Well, you would know better. Um, I, you know, I that would be absolutely fantastic if there's a way that we can share our best practice and learning with NASA. We would um, love to host uh, a team to come underground and take a look and see if we can share best practice. Nothing would be cooler. Yeah, I'm going to drop a little... Uh, you know, hey, you guys, we had this neat conversation. You need to go talk to these mining people because th- th- there's a lot of parallels, so many parallels. So, Vicki, you talked a lot about uh, the different threads, uh, not only environmental, operational, and, you know, the, the local population and indigenous people and that sort of thing. And, and it sort of leads me to think, you know, you're living at the intersection of two interesting threads. On the one hand, you know, mines produce materials that we need. They're absolutely essential to technological process, progress. Uh, to our preferred lifestyles, and in some cases to, you know, actually our very survival. Um, on the other hand, nobody wants to have one in their backyard, right? So how do you manage the criticism or, uh, you know, uh, carefully handle the fact that you're, you're sometimes doing things in places that people would rather you not be doing because it's in their backyard? How do you handle that? It's definitely the deposit is where it is, right? So nature puts it where it is. So it's very difficult when um, it is it is there. You know, the industry has changed a lot. That is, you know, we talked about it being very highly regulated. Uh, There are international, you know, best practice standards, industry, you know, um, groups that really bring the industry up. We have to do a better job of communicating to the public. Uh, You know, there was a time when there were 80 mines in the U.S., right? Two dozen smelters and refineries. Everybody really understood, you know, much better what, what mining really was and wasn't. And the industry has become a lot smaller in the U.S. over time. So we've got maybe a, you know, a dozen mines, only two smelters and refineries. So we really need to invest again back into K through 12 education, partnering with universities, and really putting ourselves out there to communicate really about what the industry is or isn't. I think that we still have a long way to go. Uh, we can still do a better job. Um, but, um, you know, the, the criticism is fair and I think the industry needs to step up and do a better job, but this is really the type of intelligent debate that we need to have. Um, we need these metals. We want more domestic production. We have to close supply chain gaps. Everyone else is going to be decarbonizing the same time as the U S and copper, especially is the metal of electrification. Um, so we need to make sure that we are listening to communities, that they're helping shape the project. Uh, that we are making concessions and foregoing maybe portions of the ore body that help preserve special places and that we're doing a better job to mitigate, you know, nature positive, save species, use less water, all of that. Well, speaking of the ore body, I, I meant to ask earlier, how on earth do you find copper when it's 7,000 feet underground? How do you know it's there? Well, we were lucky in this instance because we're in the footprint of the magma copper mine. Well, we're, we, you know, so maybe back up a little bit. We're in the copper mining uh, district of Arizona, triangle which is called there. the Copper yeah. Triangle, right? Arizona is a copper state. Seventy percent of U.S. copper comes uh, from Arizona. But this specific location, about 60 miles east of, of uh, Phoenix, is called the Copper Triangle. There has been... You know, so there's this there's this trend, or we call it a pediment of of copper, and you can kind of plot all the copper mines that tend to follow mountains, right? From the Alaska, you know, th- through the mountain ranges down the Pacific Northwest, through to the Southwest, down into Mexico. So there's that trend that exists. In our specific case, the magma copper mine, which is resolution sits within that footprint. Um, was was discovered back in the early 1900s and mined as a vein mine. It was 25 million tons of about 5% copper. And they got to the very base of it at about 4,500 feet. And they got to the limits of that deposit. They did some underground exploration from 4,500 feet, and they touched what they believed was the outer edge of the resolution deposit, which is a large copper porphyry. So not a vein mine, but right, this one and a half billion tons at one and a half percent. And so um, magma copper was bought out by BHP and then Rio Tinto became the operator. And the, the magma geologists really made the discovery. They knew something big was there. So Rio Tinto exploration just simply extended their drill holes from surface and from underground and made the discovery. But very challenging. I said earlier, you could have 
thousands of potential properties and maybe you know one in a thousand might become something that's worth taking the next step to look at and then you know a small for you know fraction of those so resolutions top three copper deposits in the world again they just they don't exist um and when you have them it's truly special hmm. it's a it goes back to that huge upfront effort that you have to expend to find the mines. Well, you know, we've really enjoyed talking with you. I could probably go for hours, but we're kind of running to the end of the the reel here. And we really appreciate, Vicki, your time. And I would love to come out and see it because I think seeing a mine like this, you have to understand the scale. You have to actually experience I it. I agree. Right? Open door, please. I yeah. uh, would love to host both of you and a, and a large contingent from NASA. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll pass that, that along. That sounds we'll great. Do science. Thank you so yeah. much. We'll do science. We'll nerd yeah. out. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Well, thank you, Vicki. Really appreciate it. Bye. That was Vicki PC, General Manager for the Resolution Copper Mine in Arizona. I'm Sandra Magnus. And I'm Sandy Winnefeld. Thanks again to Culligan Water for sponsoring this episode. It's time to get the water you love. Learn more at Culligan.com. We'll see you next week with another episode of The Adrenaline Zone.